All right. So um, I just want to explain quickly how this is going to work, and you'll find time to have conversation with each other. You know, again, this is, you know, hopefully you'll be paying more attention up here than the people around you. But um, I want to tell you how this is going to work. It's an experiment. I think that there's things that need to be said in preterism. There's a lot of questions. You know, you get done with the conference, and all of a sudden everybody's thinking, well, this wasn't answered, you know, or nobody touched on this. So I want to offer a little bit of time. Um, again, this isn't going to be a debate. You know, we're not here to debate and challenge each other that, that complicated. Um, however, hopefully it's challenging. I hope that you're going to be challenging. And um, what I'm going to do is we're going to invite up a couple people that are willing to sit on a round table. And I'm also going to just say that if uh, you're here right now and you're interested, you are also welcome to sign up. You know, again, there are plenty of people in this room that I feel are well equipped to sit on a panel and have some things in regards to preterism. This will go on the internet. There's your warning. Um, this, will, uh, this will be out there. And uh, I, I do believe that we could offer some beneficial wisdom um, in regards to guiding the, the preterist community. And um, I, I think this will be a blessed effort. So let's start a prayer. And then I'm going to invite up some of the people that have signed up. And I'm going to see if anybody else that's sitting here is, wants to, desires, or is willing to come on up and uh, feel challenged. All right? Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we approach your throne of grace, and we just ask you to bless us in this effort, Lord. Bless us with the wisdom, with the gentleness, with the desire to glorify you in all things, Lord. And bless us with clarity, that we would be able to answer questions, that we would be able to seek truthful answers, answer honestly, and allow you to be glorified through your word. So, Lord, we just we ask that, again, your presence be known, be felt, and manifested here today. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So at this time, I have a couple people that had signed up. And the people that had signed up are Pastor Steve Schilling, um, Elder Steve Hernandez, Brother Adam. We're going to try this for the last time. Before you leave, Adam, I am going to know how to pronounce your name. I promise. Last time, right now. How do I say it? I thought you were going to try to say it. No, I'm going to let you say it. All right. Marshawk. Adam Marshawk. Right? Awesome. All right. Adam Marshall's going to come on up. And myself. And is there anybody in the room that would like to sit on a panel or uh, answer some questions? I am a third person kind of guy. All right. Well, welcome, guys. Come on in. You can sit down anywhere you'd like. I'm going to serve as the moderator as well as um, I'll field questions and uh, we'll be able to answer some questions. Now, this is how we're going to do this. I have a bunch of papers. If you thought I was going to let you yell at us up here, you have the wrong party. So, we have a bunch of papers. What we're going to do is we're going to take a couple minutes and I'm going to let you have these papers. Now, this is the good news because I know how this works. I know that you get a question, right? You get this paper, you're going to write the questions down, and then you're going to listen to these men talk and you say, But I have another question. Right? So don't worry, I'm going to come around a second time and give out papers and let you ask another round of questions. So it's going to be two rounds of questions. The first time, I'm going to give out these papers now. Write down your questions. You could write as many as you could fit on this little piece of paper. And uh, you have to write the question on the paper. Uh, I, I, well, I'm going to say this. I'm simply not a fan of the, the back and forth in the pews, I, I don't. I, I don't think that'll be uh, conducive. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out these papers and uh, let's get some good questions. Real quickly, we'll make a quick modification. Again, I did tell you this is an experiment. So the modification is going to be we're also going to make the mic available for people to come up and ask the question. So instead of using the paper, you can actually just come right here and I'll hand you the mic and you can ask a question for the round table. Well, then I quit. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and then what you'll do is you'll ask your question and I will politely ask you to go back and sit down and then we will begin to ask you to answer the questions. Um, again, I, I believe 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 40 is very clear that things need to be done in decency and with order. So I believe that, you know, to the best of my ability, this is how I come up with decency and in order. So again, I'm going to come back around, I'm going to hand out the papers. If you choose to come up and ask the question by mic, that's fine as well. What I'll just ask you to do is put your hand up. And I'll, call, I'll invite you on up and we'll start asking questions. All right? So I'm going to try one more time handing out the papers and then we'll uh, get started. Come on, I can't. I got to get the mic over here. It's all right. I'll stay. 
Okay. So we ready? All right. Here we go. First question is, why do we pray? For us or for God? For us or for what? Or for God. Sorry. Now I'll speak to you guys first and then I'll tell them. Um, why do we pray? For us or for God? And then, just to substantiate that question, do we manipulate God by asking Him to do something? Well, it's okay. All right. What, why do we uh, pray? Is it for God or is it for us? Well, I think, in my opinion, it's for both. Uh, that whenever you're in a relationship with someone or you're close to somebody, the best way to get to know one another is through communication, and prayer is our communication with God. It helps us because it, it gives us the one whom we should be going to. It keeps us in mind that we are needful and that we uh, uh, have to have God as our rock and our fortress. Whereas for God, He hears us, He knows that we're dependent upon Him. If we turn our back, walk away from Him, and uh, uh, don't count on him for things. I'm, certain, I'm sure, as a parent, I would want my child to want me. And I'm sure that in a relationship as father to children, he would want us to want him as well. And is it okay to, what was the second part of the question? Um, is it manipulate God? Or yeah, do, is we, it, do we manipulate Yeah, do we manipulate God? Yeah, are we, do we, oh, do we, do we manipulate him? God by asking him to do something? To add up. Uh, no, I don't think we manipulate him. Of course, he knows our needs even before we do. Uh, whether it comes to a, an illness or loss of a job, whatever it might be, whatever we ask for, it is not news to God. But it is a, a way in which we can, again, allow him to comfort us, to call upon him to, uh, to help. And whatever answer he gives, whether it's the illness is healed or, or we pass away from it, um, that's his answer. And I think that when we keep those lines of communication open with it, that whatever answer he gives us, we trust and we can count that's the right one for us. Amen. Um, yeah, I agree about it being um, to the benefit of both us and God and for the reasons that my brother shared. Um, the question about manipulating God is an interesting one. I think generally, no, for the same reason. I, the one case that came to mind um, where people may attempt to manipulate God would be, for example, um, person A begging God to cause this football team to win today, while person B, maybe on that team, is begging God for the other football team to win. How does, how does God make that, that choice? What are we trying to uh, make God do when we, when we pray for something trivial like that? Uh, where God is hearing prayers for the opposite things from his children. So that's one example I thought of. Well, I might ask uh, Pastor Mike to help me out with the, uh, the actual wording of this. But in his sermon today, he talked about John Piper. And I think he said something along the lines of, you know, God is most satisfied with you when you are most satisfied and most connected to him. And I think that's that's very important. It's a very, very classic and important um, uh, issue that has come up um, through the rabbis and in, in Jewish thought. Uh, it's commented on a lot. As a matter of fact, it's the a very similar theme is the dedication of Jonathan Sachs' book, Covenant and Conversation, where uh, he, his blessing to those reading the book is, uh, may, God, uh, may, may God rejoice in you as you rejoice in one another. And that reciprocal theme is something that really carries through through, through, through the tradition. And I think it carries through to even Jesus uh, when he's teaching us pray this way. So I'd invite everybody to go home and read the Lord's Prayer and, and contemplate it. And, and, and I think you'll, you'll find just revelation, like Pastor, Pastor Steve said, just by being immersed together with the Lord. I think uh, I don't have anything to say. I thought that was sufficient responses. I'm going to move on to the next question. <coughs> Here we go. This is a fun one. In what form will our bodies be at the resurrection? 
Any takers? All right, well, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> All right, well, when we open up our Bible, and the, the text that we find, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the famous body text, um, one of the things that was mentioned last night in the debate is when we get to 1 Corinthians 15 and it begins to talk about the moon and the stars and the sun and all of those details, the Apostle Paul reiterating that there are some that say there will be no resurrection from the dead. And then he goes on and he says that uh, they ask what kind of body, with what kind of body will they come? That, that's the question. Now, again, I, I understand that the futurist persuasion would argue that what we're reading there is what kind of bodies, like physical bodies or immortal glorified bodies, um, that individual people would come in, right? That's the individual body at death. And the preterist perspective would be that, that um, upon death, we receive a glorified individual body, that each and every one of us become a part of that individual, that glorified reality. Um, I, I would take a different perspective. Um, again, the corporate body view, um, I believe that what we're seeing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it's talking about bodies, the bodies that, of the resurrection, it's saying that God can give any type of body to anything, just like he gave the body to the stars, they have a different form, the moon, the sun, the animals, all these different things have different styles or different forms of bodies. And God can give the dead ones, the dead that were going to be raised, any form of body he could, he would. Um, in other words, how would they be included in the resurrection from the dead? Now, as far as us, and I, I'll just, uh, I'll end with this point. As far as us, when we die and we are, again, because I don't believe we're going to be resurrected. I believe we are resurrected. We are a resurrected people. We, we might dare say that we are the resurrection people. And we, when we die, we shed, clearly this body goes into the ground and you know, returns to dust, and we go to be with our Lord. I do not believe, and maybe some of you will qualify this, I, I do not believe that Scripture is giving us the definition of what we will be like in our post-mortem state. Again, it's talking, we are in our post-mortem state, glorified as God's body. That's what the scriptures are talking about. Now, when we're talking about us dying individually and what happens, I don't believe the scriptures to be explaining that reality. And instead, we would simply go to be with the Lord in whatever form he is. I would just reiterate that myself. I think it's, it's mistaken, and it's very Western and very modern to try and, you know, do a one-to-one -one kind of linear mapping of this is my um, this is my incarnate body, this is my uh, you know, this, this is my fleshly body, and I will map that over to that being perfected, uh, and uh, maybe I'll look like I'm 25 again and have muscles I never had before. You know, I think that gets a little bit silly. Those details are simply not in the text, and when you study Jewish thought and when you study um, Jewish teaching stories that, that try and describe things that are greater than we are. Uh, Heschel um, says it, it's, the, it's the finite trying to uh, describe the infinite. And he says it's the predicament of man. And when man is faced with this predicament, what he does is he anthropomorphizes. He, he, he takes things that make sense to him. And we know that only a fool leans upon his own misunderstanding. So I think what it's wise to do is to really look at the text and, 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 and just think and trust in God that his plan for us is eternal. We will have everything we need and not worry about details like will my dog be there and uh, you know, will I recognize my aunt Betty. It's so, so much bigger than that. It's so, so much more important than that. And I think when we sit down and pray and prepare ourselves and open ourselves up and just Look at the essence, the essence of the text. What's the big picture of the text? These things then will be revealed to us. Uh, to follow up on what my brothers have already said, um, I'm not going to offer an opinion, no. but related to what they've already said, I just wanted to read a few verses where Paul asks this question and then gives um, a response, which um, I'm not... 100% certain I understand where he was going with it all the way. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through about 40. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Exactly what we are asking about. He continues, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. 
And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. Very interesting. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Now I think the next couple of verses um, explain why he said it that way. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, so that's the comparison he's making, <clears throat> another of fish and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And he, and he keeps going. Just very interesting, and I'm not going to offer much of an opinion. What version was that? Uh, this is the New King James. This is a subject that I'm still exploring myself personally, to be honest. The chapter and verse. Oh, did I not say the chapter and verse? 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I started in verse 35 and went through verse 41. I take the uh, corporate body view of salvation and all that, all that includes. Uh, and here I think within the text of the body, it's whether you're still in the body of Moses under war and condemnation, or which will die, and then be raised in that glorified body of the body of Christ. Uh, when, as a believer today, since... Um, since uh, the new covenant has been established, we are resurrected upon the new birth, or the, the birth from above. And with that quickened spirit, that's what remains alive when this physical body passes away. Whatever particular form that might be, I don't know. I don't think the scriptures tell us that. Um, nor do we need to know. It is by faith that we walk, and by faith, and trusting in Christ that when this mortal body does perish and go away, that what has been living for Christ and in Christ uh, will be raised and, and be with Him. Wherever that is, uh, it's said that we are no closer to Him today than we will be then. Uh, if you are in Christ, you are in Christ. Uh, the scriptures of uh, verse 15 continue and they say in one uh, verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is ra raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Don't see anywhere in the text where it goes back to physical. That spiritual body is our quickened spirits being in communion with Christ, being in, in his body, period. Doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. Thank you all for that. This next question actually kind of follows up on that, what we just talked about. So I, I thought I'd use this one next. Uh, the resurrection of the dead was promised to Israel. We see this in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, right? We see this in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 9, uh, 19, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Acts chapter 26, verses 6 through 9, Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 28, we could keep going. We see this as a promise to Old Covenant Israel. We see in Acts chapter 19, verse 9, that this is the way, right? Jesus is the way. He is the way into the resurrection of the dead. So all of that said, that this is a promise to Israel in the Old Covenant, right? These are promises for them to go into a new glorified body. Doesn't this prove the way is the resurrection of the dead? Jesus is the resurrection of the dead. And this is fulfilled by his appearing, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. So would we not agree that this is already a fulfilled event that was promised to Israel, the resurrection of the dead? That, that would sum up the question. Um, that this is not something we are yet hoping for. This is something that was, instead I right. go through the list of verses. Would, would that not prove that? Any takers? You want me to go? Yeah. go? Oh, all right. You go. You sure. <laughs> All right, I always, my, my fallback uh, verses on that are from uh, uh, John, First uh, John 3, uh, 
when uh, Lazarus had passed away and Jesus comes uh, and Martha and, and, and Mary are talking to him. When they come to him, uh, the first thing they say is they ask Jesus, if you had been here, um, uh, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That, and, and they knew that he would be raised on the last day. They had some understanding of a resurrection that was to take place on the last day of the Old Covenant. When the Messiah comes and that Messianic age begins, when he is going to be the king and leads over Israel, uh, that he would be raised. They trusted in him. Jesus said to, uh, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Referring to old covenant saints. That, that they would live even though they had passed away. Now he takes another shift into just the same sentence. And he's talking about the new covenant saints. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. I don't think that Jesus was referring strictly to a physical because we all die physically. But he is talking about that quickened spiritual uh, being that we become upon that new birth and, and being <coughs> born from above. It is a supernatural spiritual thing that we just don't have it the concrete, tangible evidence to be able to produce. But we don't need it because we have faith. Jesus said it. I believe it. I think that's all we need to stand on. I actually thought that was a really good question because it was obviously, it showed the Bible verses um, that point to the resurrection of the dead. Um, one of the big problems I have within the preterist community is that we have this divide between the IBD and the CBV. Um, you know, I've talked in preterism numerous times about the need to debate these even in-house, you know, an in-house debate where we can show the difference between what the individual body at death view is saying, the verses in Romans 8, Philippians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans chapter 8, um, I think Romans chapter 7 through 8, uh, Revelation chapter 20, the first resurrection, the second resurrection. Um, again, I, I believe it's a conversation we need to have, and the problem being is that most of us, we're still, even as preterists, we approach the Bible with this mentality that it has, it has to be saying something about me when I die. You, you see, but unfortunately, our, our Bible isn't framed in that way. That's not the story our Bible is telling us. Our Bible is telling us about Old Covenant Israel, their death. Again, I urge everybody here to just go to Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, and ask yourself, what death is that? What death was Israel seeking to be saved from? And then you begin to understand the significance of the resurrection of the dead. Because again, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, is a verse used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, Steve, I thank you for uh, clarifying that and helping us realize that, again, this was a hope of Israel. And these details have indeed been fulfilled. Now, when we're talking about what happens to us when we die, we have to come to a point where we admit that the Bible is ne not necessarily telling us that reality. And I just want to say one more thing, please. Um, I, when I talked to Ed Stevens one day, Mr. Ed Stevens, and we, we had a discussion about this, he made a really good point. You know, I might, I might corner myself here. Um, he, he made a really good point when he said to me, well, okay, so I would agree with you that the dead were raised in 87. He would agree with me there. However, he asked me, how were they raised? You see, and I said, I said, well, they were raised. And he said, well, how? With what form were they raised? How did the dead ones go into the glory of the Father? And to be quite honest with you, I, I don't believe the scriptures to be de detailing that point. I believe that would be way beyond the human mind to say how we're going to, and I'm not, I don't want to placate myself by just simply saying, oh, a glorified body, of course. You know, I, I believe, as Don Preston has said, that uh, Jesus came in the self, when he was resurrected, he was resurrected in the self same body that he had prior. He walked through walls before, he's disappeared in the middle of nowhere before he walked on water. I mean, again, we see Jesus doing many things in his physical body that I don't think anybody in this room's body ever has done. You know, so um, again, I, I believe Jesus had that self-same body when he raised from the dead. It wasn't this 
um, what we're calling the glorified body. The glorified body is what you all celebrated this morning, the glorified body of Christ. So, that's it. Next question is aimed at me, and I'm just going to direct the Pastor Steve now. <laughs> um, here we go. Let's see. Question for Pastor Mike. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11 says, the righteous will still be righteous, the filthy will still be filthy, and we will be in the new heavens and new earth. In Genesis, Adam and Eve gave birth to three children. Cain was a non-believer, a reprobate. Even up to now, in our new heavens and new earth, believers are surrounded by non-believers. What do you think? God's God's reason to arrange it like this has been non-believers to be the well-being, or is for the well non-believers to contribute to the well-being of believers. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that uh, what we see in Revelation chapters 21 through 22 is the, is indeed the current reality we are enjoying. If you remember in, in that city, the gates were always open. Hopefully many of you are inviting people into the glorious new covenant. The gates are always open and that there are still the filthy in the world, let the filthy remain filthy and let the righteous be righteous. Again, we see that. And I believe it's very clear um, in the old covenant, we see that the foreigner was brought into the, you know, the, the uh, people of Israel, being the covenant people at that time. The foreigner was used to bless the people of Israel. And the people of Israel were to bless the foreigner by representing their God properly. And we today are doing the same exact thing. We are hopefully, prayerfully, we're blessing the world around us by representing our God properly and, you know, that they are being called into that kingdom. So, and again, I do believe that, you know, um, one of the things I heard recently was that the Romans had paved um, roads that served to, actually, I believe somebody here, Mr. Ed Stevens, I believe, that had said that, you know, the, the roads that the Romans paved actually served to help preach the gospel. So again, we would see very clearly that, yes, the non-believers do indeed in this world help us. They, they, they serve us. They help us. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament. Anybody want to take that? Okay. Hey, that's, that's it. <laughs> yes, I know. I recognize this. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. According to preterists, what is the second death in the lake of fire? And who goes there? Alright, I'll go for it. <laughs> Let's see. What is the second death in the lake of fire? And who goes there? So in Revelation chapter 20. Okay, I'm just going to read this text here. Starting in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones. Again, this is John's vision. Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So right there, I've already qualified the death that we're talking about throughout the Old Covenant. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, again, the veil that was over the people of God, that Old Covenant that produced death because they were not obedient to the principles of that covenant. Um, that was the first death. The second death would be when the Messiah comes into the world and he offers you the opportunity to come to life and yet you avoid that, you even you miss that point, and now you're going to be given, given over to complete death, the judgment of God, where God was going to, the coming of the Lord was going to come into Jerusalem. Not only were they suffering from the old covenant death that they needed to be redeemed from, now they would experience the second death. And basically, that is old covenant Israel being defined and their system is completely done. So again, the first resurrection was those that put their faith in Christ. If you put your faith in Christ, the second death had no power over you. And that when that judgment came, you would not experience death at that judgment. And then the lake of fire, again, is a, um, I, I would say that that is a euphemism used in our Bible to, again, complete destruction. I mean, how do you have a lake of fire? 
It's it, clearly something that symbolizes destruction. And when those who are thrown in the lake of fire in our Bible here, um, moving down to verse 10, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented for uh, night. They will be tormented day and night forever. And again, this is the lake of fire. Again, talking about destruction. The, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So again, that was being destroyed there. The beast. Again, another term we would want to qualify. That requires a Bible study of the Book of Revelation, um, not a five-minute response. Um, however, the beast that was tormenting the church in the days of the book of Revelation being written, obviously I would posit a pre-AD 70 date. Um, you could put Nero as that beast, you could put Vespasian as that beast, you could put Titus as that beast. And you know, all three of their names equals 666. So, you know, you might put all three of them. I've even heard that, the evil trinity. Um, all of them had something to do with the persecution of the church in that first century period. Nero, Vespasian, and Titus. So, um, again, you could see that as being that beast and that false prophet. Some have posited that Vespasian might be the beast, and Titus might be the false prophet, you know, that, that did the works of the beast. You know, Vespasian told his son Titus to go into the city of Jerusalem, surround the city, and ultimately that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. So what we're reading here is the destruction of that old covenant. Again, as you move into the next chapter in Revelation chapter 21, it begins to talk about a new heaven and a new earth, complete new reality in opposition to that old heaven and old earth. So... Today, I don't believe anybody's going to know Lake of Fire. I believe you have options. You have eternal life in Christ, or you're eternally dead. Those are the reality of what we're facing in our world today. When this question comes up, I like to go straight to uh, Revelation. Uh, um, and in 2014, it says, And death and Hades were thrown into the Lake of Fire. This is the second death, the Lake of Fire. Well, what were death and Hades? Death and Hades were separation from God. That's what that was. What was the hope of Israel? The hope of Israel was not to be separated from God. The hope of Israel was that the tabernacle of God would be with men, that he would be their God and they would be their people eternally. So the hope of Israel was reconciliation unto the Godhead, assimilation into the Godhead, to be one in communion with God. So when you take a look at that, and you look at the many, many times this hope is repeated, Revelation 21, um, Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31, Revelation 7, John 14, Exodus 29, throughout the entire Bible, it becomes very clear what they hoped for, and very clear what they hoped would not happen to them. I really think that that's the best way to look at uh, just kind of a, a very broad view of, of, of what their hope was and, and what that verse means. And, uh, just to agree with one thing that Michael said, not that I'm disagreeing with anything, but uh, Michael said that um, the image of the lake of fire is a euphemism. And in the Old Testament, Isaiah and some of the other prophets um, often um, described judgment upon um, different nations uh, in the same way. Uh, for example, Isaiah 13, it's a proclamation against Babylon. In verse 17, he even specifically uh, mentions the Medes coming against Babylon. And we know that that happened in Daniel's day. The, Medo, the Medes and the Persians uh, overthrew Babylon after Babylon had overthrown Jerusalem. But I hope I can find the verse I'm looking for in this chapter. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe I'm not finding the one I was thinking about. But in verse 10, it says, The stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. This is talking about Babylon. Um, the sun will be darkened and it's going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I thought there might be a verse in there about smoke rising forever. But that language is used in similar instances where Isaiah or Jeremiah or somebody is describing the downfall of Babylon or Egypt or, or Edom. But this is obviously a euphemism. That doesn't mean that the stars that we look up to and see in the night sky came down at that time. No, it means that that nation's defeat was, was final. And that's the way that the prophets used that imagery of smoke burning forever. It doesn't mean that we can go to where ancient Edom was and still see that smoke rising, um, you know, 
nearly 3,000 years later. I think, I think this, the, the verses that we're talking about here in Revelation 20 are at a time when God is clearing out uh, Hades and Sheol, closing out the Old Covenant. Uh, those who were dead in there was Old, Test, Old Testament uh, Israel, dead under the law, condemned by the law, that they would be uh, thrown in as well. That there would be no longer a Hades nor a Sheol or any other sort of holding area that when a saint is called home and at their death with their uh, quickened spirit, they remain alive with uh, Christ. That those who do not know the Lord then simply would perish. So it's really a, a clearing house at this time. Please explain the devil's thousand years in the pit and then being let out. Oliver? Oh, oh, you're a good man. <laughs> um, well, as a lot of you know, I have a I have a blog on the book of Revelation and have really dived in deep deeply um, studying out the, the entire book of Revelation. But I've said and I'll say it again, I think that Revelation chapter 20, where this question is based, is to me the most difficult chapter in the book of Revelation, if, if not almost the Bible. Um, and I've kind of gone back and, back and forth, and I'm just going to offer up an idea that I'm exploring right now. I'm not saying that it is what I've settled upon and will never change, uh, and it's, it's this. Um, there's a position that some people call atavism, A-T-A-V-I-S-M, and it's, uh, it's basically that the 1,000 years started in 70 A.D. and lasted for about 70 years, covering the time from Jerusalem's downfall in 70 A.D. until the um, Simon Bar Kokhba revolt, another Jewish rebellion, in 135. I think about 135 A.D. Um, and Simon Bar Kokhba and his, and his gang, from what I've uh, learned, actually tried to eradicate the Christian population in that region, um, in what was Judea and Palestine, and attempted to eradicate that population in line with um, this language that we see here about um, surrounding the camp of the saints. Let's see here, verse... They went up on the... Verse 9 of chapter 20. They went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Well, Revelation has already revealed the beloved city to be not earthly Jerusalem, but heavenly Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, new covenant community. So the armies of Satan surrounded the new Jerusalem. Um, in, in, a, in an attempt to persecute and eradicate, yes, so. We're not going to do that. Yeah, none of that. But that's an idea that I'm exploring because I have not seen any of the other explanations convince me 100%. It's a difficult passage. I'm just exploring it. I'm just throwing that idea out there. Um, it's still within preterism. It's still not saying that it's future, but then that's the release of uh, that's the that's the final release and defeat of the forces that tried to eradicate the Christians once again. <laughs> Anybody else brave enough? Let's see. I think I have some thoughts here. I actually have a study guide that I did. I, I preached through Revelation for three months here at the church, and I created a little study guide called Clarity in Revelation. I have an entire sermon on the internet called The Thousand Years Clarified, and I, I believe I actually do indeed offer some clarity. So what I'm going to do is try to guide you through a little bit of this. Real quickly. Again, the first question I ask in my, in my study here is the binding of Satan. Who's the angel that binds Satan? Well, you, you see uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He's the, the angel that has the key. Right? Luke 8 tells you who that angel is. It's Jesus. Jesus has the key to bind Satan. And then we see in Matthew chapter 12, real quickly, Matthew chapter 12, verses 20 through 2 through 
going to read this. I'm actually, I'm not going to read the entire passage. I'm just going to read uh, a couple verses here. Jesus, you know, he rebukes, um, he, he casts the demons out of this man, and the Pharisees begin to say that this man cannot be the son of David. And well, the crowds say that. The Pharisees hear this. They say that this man's casting out these demons by Beelzebub, and the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus says this to them. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, for who do your sons cast them out by? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? and then he will plunder his house. So again, I, I believe very clearly, and I ask you in the study guide, how does Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 29 apply here? You see Jesus binding Satan, very, very simply. What about, the first, what about the time of the first century makes it seem as though Satan was bound? Again, if you look from the time of Jesus' proclamation of the gospel up until the time of Nero, you see the, the gospel actually reaches the, the entire known world, it reaches everybody. Uh, according to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 23, every creature under the heavens had heard the gospel. So again, Satan was bound. The gospel was able to be preached throughout the world, leading up to the time of Nero. And you get to it roughly about the time of A.D. 64. And again, you see the reign of the saints. I can give you a bunch of verses on that. John chapter 11, verse 25, Ephesians chapters 1 through 2. The saints are seated in heavenly places during this time. And, and that would be pretty much from A.D. 27 to A.D. 64. The loosing of Satan in A.D. 64, we begin to see the church comes under persecution. Again, mentioning Nero, we see this, you know, just continues pretty much throughout that history. And that would have been the loosing of Satan. The binding of Satan was the fact that Jesus came, gave the disciples the power to even bind Satan. And as he said, what they, Jesus tells his disciples, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And so the, the disciples have the opportunity to bind Satan and then... They're preaching the gospel. They're making the gospel known to all the nations. They're reigning with Christ for that thousand years, that time of completion. And then ultimately at the end of that, Satan has to be loosed. And we see the church comes under persecution. And there's your Satan being bound and there's your Satan being loosed. And he was loosed for a short period of time because AD 64 to AD 70, again, a very short period of time, all of a sudden the, the city, you know, the, the attention of the Romans turns away from the church back onto the city of Jerusalem, the Jews. And they begin to have the, the pressure of Rome rather than the Christians. So you see, again, one of the things we would have to qualify, and I don't believe, uh, prayerfully, that's not one of our questions. Um, I'm not going to do that to myself today. Um, but there's, there's a question that, you know, we would have to qualify who Satan is. That's what, you know, I'm just going to say it. We would have to qualify Satan. And if you do put that question in the next time around, I'm going to give you a very short answer, and you're not going to like it because um, it requires a lot of study and a lot of details. So, um, again, you know, we would have to, what I would promise you is that if you study your Bible, and I'll just say this very simply, and I'll stop talking. If you were to study your Bible, you're going to see a lot of adversaries of God. A lot of adversaries of God's people all throughout the Old Testament. That term Satan is used in many different ways, and we need to study that. to what I was talking about. I, I should have mentioned that the reason why I have a hard time seeing the thousand years starting um, around 30 AD, for example, is the language in uh, verse 4. And again, I'm still s struggling with this and working through this, but these are just thoughts. Um, verse 4 says, I saw, I saw thrones, they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Um, and one quick note, it doesn't mean that Christ's reign was limited to a thousand years, but the reign of those individuals was, uh, was limited to that time period. But the people who reigned um, with Christ for a thousand years were those who rejected the mark of the beast. And that's something that took place not around 30 AD, but 66, 67. And so I think I said earlier that this um, position I'm exploring sees the 1,000 years from 70 AD. I should have said from about 66 AD until 135 AD. I'm not convinced. I'm still exploring, and I want to keep on exploring the, uh, 
position that, that Michael has, has brought up as well. Tough message. It, it is. Mm -hmm. I, did, could you clarify more? I didn't quite understand it, but what I just said. Yeah, the clarifying about how you put the, the thousand in context. Um, I have a hard time based on. Right. I have a hard time based on verse 4 seeing the 1,000 years beginning any time before about 66 AD because those who were qualified to reign with Christ for 1,000 years were those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. If we believe... So this is well, presupposing the nation of the beast. Yes, presupposing that the beast uh, was manifest, you know, around 64, 65, 66, 67 A.D. I'm talking about Nero and the, the Roman Empire, and uh, requiring that that worship as we as we see in history around that time, not 30 A.D., not 40 A.D., but you know, mid 60s, mid to late 60s. Is the thousand years literal? As a literal 1,000 year period? Yeah. I don't. I don't, do you? No. So, really, now it says, I'm going to use that. This is a little bit. I'm going to use that one. Use that one. I'm going to use this one as well. Okay. It's not as loud, but I'm going to use my role. So, I'll plug in. Um, about 1,000. If it was 1,000, it would use 3 from Chilo, Chilios. Uh, if it was more, more than 1,000, like 2,000, it would be the word for two, and then chilios, and, or three of the chilos, but this is chiloi, which is undefined length of a lot, a, a lot, an undefined large number. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, I have to say, uh, Adam, you know, just a quick question. Um, is that Daniel Marias' view? Uh, I don't think his is like that. I believe Daniel Marais says that the 1,000 years began, um, I'm sorry, began around this time and continued until about the time of the Vikings, 1,000 AD. I believe that's so what he, he said. He thinks about it's a literal 1,000, then. Yeah. He does, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because the word doesn't even, in the Greek world, mean 1,000. That's what my point was. Oh, yeah, sure. It has the wrong ending on the Greek word. Chiloi, chilioi is a large number. It chili, you know, if it was in, in English, you could say 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or just 1,000. It means that. But chili oi, oi makes a kind of a pluralish ending on the end, which is kind of like similar, about a 1,000. It makes it nondescript. And even Strong, who by Hayes' definitions, says a large number of uncertain definity. That's his definition of the word 1,000 there. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, there's an extra seat up here. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't um, need to interrupt. So, no, that's all right. I'm just messing with you. Um, hopefully, you have a good heard, It was her question about meaning exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, the Greek word doesn't mean that. No, um, you can ask questions. Oh. You just have to write them down or come up and approach yeah, the mic. That's what I said. I'm right. sorry, too. Like so, I, um, <laughs> with, um, with the millennium, you, there's a lot of complication. Again, our next question is, what is the millennium according to the preterist? That's why I'm doing this. So, um, the, again, the millennium is a complicated topic. We, we, we must agree there. The, the term, yeah. as Brother Doug has made very clear to us, that term is, is not a term that is used in a definite amount. We, we don't know. You know. And again, that's why we're seeing, and I do understand the frustration. Um, you know who I believe explains this really well is Mr. Ed Stevens in his book, the final decade before the end. He has a lot of good details in there that will challenge you in regards to what's happening in that history. Because I know one of the interesting points that is made is that, as Adam makes, is that, well, if these are the persecuted martyrs that are not receiving the mark of the beast, they have to be after AD 30. And um, I, I believe that can be explained. Um, you know, Revelation not always necessarily a chronological book um, and the details. I, I would want to explore that a little bit further before I... Uh, Take myself any deeper on video. Same here. All right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to move on to the next question here. <laughs> What's that? We can call him back on the <laughs> Do you think heaven 
is a place or a state of being. Our spirits of deceased around us then and now in the spiritual realm. <laughs> okay. In my opinion, I don't think there's a particular location up in the sky that has God and a group of people hanging out. I think that when we call ourselves Christian, our spirit is quickened, we enter into Christ. I don't think that there is a difference between being in Christ and being in heaven. When you're there, there it, that's, it, that's where Christ is, that's where we are, we're positioned there, our estate is to be there, wherever it is. There isn't a concrete location, I don't need a concrete body in order to enter into it. It is a supernatural spiritual effect that takes place. And again, the scriptures aren't clear, they don't explain these things. I mean, there is a lot of science fiction t out there as far as raising up into the sky, being in the clouds, coming back down, going back up, and all of this stuff. But I think that the script, one thing that the scriptures are clearer about, for the saints who enter into salvation, you enter into Christ, the glorified body, that that is where positionally heaven basically is. As Israel had to be in the land, as Adam had to be in the garden, we are in Christ. And that's that's the final location where we need to be. I would agree completely. I, sometimes I'm asked that, those types of questions, and, and there are no GPS coordinates for, uh, in, for, for where, where God is or where uh, where it will be. Um, and I think it's it's a real it's a real important thing to really do is exactly as Pastor Shalane did and just speak of it being in a spiritual realm. Because a lot of times, you know, with teenagers and things like that, I'm you know, they're they're anxious to bring up uh, science and, and look for a science explanation. And and as a scientist, uh, I, uh, I I love to tell people, look, science and the things of God are not mutually exclusive. They're not it is not either a science explanation or a or a uh, you know or, or a religious or a spiritual explanation that you know that 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 uh, that God is greater than all of that and uh, sometimes we'll hear things like you know well maybe it's a, in a different dimension or you have to go through a wormhole and I just you, you you couldn't be more farther from that it really really is a reconciliation unto the Godhead communion with God being assimilated one with. In, in being with the Father. And uh, I think that uh, it's, it's a difficult concept to get our arms around, but at the same time, if we pray about it and meditate about it, just the, the little inkling of peace we feel while we're praying about it is just the, is just the beginning of what it actually is. So I think that's important. Heaven is all around us, and I uh, have some examples right here. 14 miles away, gasoline heaven. 6.7 miles away, baseball heaven. Uh, Sound of Heaven Church, 21 miles away. Heaven is all around us, according to uh, the GPS. Amen. All right. Good deal. Thanks for getting the coordinates for us. Yes. All right. Good deal. Um, I, I would agree. If I, if I may just say one thing about that, um, I'm working on a book right now, kind of exploring Hebrew spirituality. Um, I believe that if we're going to begin to try to understand what demons are, um, we need to stop advancing the new world system, the new age system that's so clear in our paganistic society. And um, we're, you know, pretty much I hear Christians talk about demons. They sound just like the paganists that I, pagans that I know talking about demons and, and spiritual things. Um, the Hebrews had a very distinct spirituality. And when we study their spirituality, we realize that you know, there's quite a few things. For example, the Hebrews didn't believe that the physical world was a bad thing, or your physical body is a lowly bad thing. Um, that, that is not a Hebrew thought. Um, the Hebrews believed that the natural world was good, that this is a beautiful thing. This is God created this world. However, they believed that there was a spiritual dimension, a spiritual component to this natural world. Um, that what we're seeing in the physical is, is demonstrating something spiritually. And when we begin to talk about heaven, the, again, simply in your Old Testament, the, the Israelites, their heaven was being in the land of Israel. Have, being at peace with all their enemies and nobody wanting to conquer them and kick them out of their land. You know, I get to eat my own food that I planted. That's heaven. That's heaven in your Old Testament. 
So in the New Testament, heaven is, again, being in Christ, that spiritual reality that we enjoy, that, again, while the old covenant was a natural covenant, they had a fear of people coming into their land, stealing their goods, kicking them out of the land. That symbolized a covenant with God. Every time that they were invaded by the Assyrians, that, that was, God's mad at us. That was their spirituality. The natural demonstrated the spiritual reality. So in Christ, we've been seated in heavenly places. We see this in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Those were living saints that were seated in the heavenlies. So again, as Pastor Steve clearly illustrated, that being in Christ is being in heaven. It is being in the heavenlies. Now, what we're not saying is that this doesn't continue into a realm beyond this natural realm. Of course that. We, we know it does. God is eternal. God lives. You know, I don't think he lives in those coordinates. But um, <laughs> he, he lives all around us. And he, uh, maybe the sound of heaven church. Actually. Yeah, um, I was going to say. So, um, you see, that's, we need to have a Hebrew spirituality about these things. We need to try to understand how the Hebrews would have thought about heaven and not necessarily how our 21st century Greek, con you know, we demand a concrete understanding, explain this to me. That's a Greek. We, we need to stop thinking like that and be comfortable, as uh, Steve and I have had many talks about this, you know, we need to be comfortable with the Hebraic mindset that a lot of things were very abstract thought, and they were comfortable with that, and we need to be comfortable with that, and just trust in our God. Last question, before we accept uh, a couple more. And I'm going to have us out of here by 3.30, so any questions that aren't uh, answered by 3.30, we're just going to have to submit to uh, Jesus and uh, hope he'll answer them. How do you know for certain, I'll talk to you guys, how do you know for certain that Nero and Titus were the mark of the beast? Do you mind if I just answer that real quick? I don't know for certain that Nero and Titus were the mark of the beast. Um, I believe that term again, 666, and this is just simply, a, hopefully they'll qualify better than me, but the term 666 again can, can compute to plenty of things. Actually, there's a, a, a site you can go on the internet, and it'll show you everything, 666. If you study Hebrew gematria, everything it could mean. You might be able to make your name. That, that's pretty neat. You can find out if your name equals 666. And, um, you know, again, it, it's studying Hebrew gematria. We come to see that, yes, ter Nero, Titus, they do demonstrate the mark of the beast. It seems to fit with the context of what was going on in Jerusalem in AD 64 to AD 70, and where this writing's finding its completion. And um, that's why we would take, I would take that stand, that... You know, Nero, Vespasian, Titus, um, all of that. Doing the work of Rome rather than doing the work of the Christians, you know, your mind and your hands, what you put your mind and your hand to. Um, those that were living outside of the system of Jesus Christ, outside of the, the covenant with Jesus Christ, were manifesting the mark of the beast. The, the Jews in covenant with Rome were manifesting that mark of the beast. Wow. Well, you can do better than that. Well... The only thing I can add is that it's probably a barcode that we really <laughs> No, it's a chip. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> as, as, as Mike was saying, that it's not a particular image or mark that you see either on your forehead or your hand, but that it is the direction that your line of your your hand would be leading you in. And the beast would be that away from Christ and away from God and following him, doing what the natural world would want you to do, have your mindset on that, have your hand to the plow to accomplish that work. Whereas the mark of Christ that we get can have also is that where our mind and our hand are now directed towards God, doing the work that he has called us to do. So there are two marks, uh, depending on which way you go, uh, that the scriptures speak of. One could be towards the worldly. Uh, way away from God or towards God and, and working for Him. So, no, it's not a, well, maybe a chip these days. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I feel that I know for certain that Nero was spoken of in Revelation 13, the same chapter that talks about the mark of the beast, for a number of reasons. And I'll just give one key reason. I actually have a post on my on my blog called um, Revelation 13, 10 Fulfilled Prophecies um, about um, how the prophecies of Revelation 13 and 17 were fulfilled um, in the lives of Nero and also in Rome in general. But verses 5 through 7 in chapter 13 are very specific about the beast. He was given a mouth, and this is the beast from the sea. There's actually also a beast from the land. But this is the beast from the sea. And sea often, even in the Old Testament, represented 
the Gentile lands where the, um, the land or the earth was about Israel. But here's Revelation 13, 5 through 7. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is the same as three and a half years. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, Authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Um, Nero is very much on record as blaspheming God and, and Christians and, and um, making war uh, on the Christian church. I mean, the persecution, the killings, the martyrdom was, was um, almost unspeakable. The things that he and his comrades did to the Christians at that time. But the 42 months is very significant. Uh, Nero's campaign of persecution began in November of 64 AD and ended at the time of his death in June of 68 AD. If you do the math, that's precisely 42 months. I'll sit on a round table with Adam. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess we need more questions. You have more questions? Anybody have more questions? All right, so that's good. No more I questions. Have uh, oh, wow. I, I guess I can ask this myself with the mic. Yeah, I, you want to do that? You want to ask yourself? Yeah, I might as well. Cool. I don't know. Yeah, okay, it is. Does the preterist view allow for speaking in tongues today? Um, a lot of people speak in tongues. Um, they believe it's prayer in the spirit. Um, perfect prayer and praise to God. It, it builds you up spiritually. Um, to them, it's not over. So, what are your views on that? Well, you know, having been raised Catholic and then having my first exposure to tongues and prophecy and, and uh, all the gifts of the Spirit, um, you know, later on in, in, when I was in college at that age. Um, and then coming to preterism and, and looking at the other side of that, um, I would say those might be incredibly important tools to some people. Um, a, a type of meditative state, a type of gamma state, a way to, to really reach God in, an, in their own individual way. But as far as the biblical basis for uh, still receiving prophecy or still um, or we're speaking in tongues, um, I, I don't see it. As a matter of fact, the, the common passages that are cited, and I get this all the time where people say to me, I say, just keep reading, flip the page and keep reading. Because uh, it goes on to say, you know, when I was a child, I did the things of a child, but when the perfect comes, and as preterists, we believe the perfect has come. Right. And, uh, and that's, I think, the difference there. So it's people who speak in tongues are, are not. Um, I, I would have to say from personal experience, uh, I don't think it's biblical, but it's, it's certainly they're not idolaters or doing anything incorrect. I know with me in the Pentecostal churches, um, you know, they continued to tell me that I wasn't saved because I wasn't showing the gifts of the Spirit, and I had a lot of well-thinking people plastering their hands on my head and just say, just say anything, just, just start it off, just say anything, just go, just go, just say anything, you know. And, uh, and, and they said, well, you're not saved because you're not manifesting gifts of the Spirit. And I really th thought that it was a very mistaken and very uh, uh, strange direction to go in. And, but I never held it against them that, I, that they really uh, felt better. And you know, some, some people like to sing their prayers. And some people like to kneel or lay prostrate. And these are all tools, but uh, they're, they're not, uh, there's no biblical foundation for it after, um, you know, after the perfect has come. Okay, as preterists, we see this time uh, between Pentecost and 70 AD when Jesus led the second exodus, very similar to that of the first exodus where Moses brought uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. And as they wandered through the wilderness, many signs and wonders were given to them, the uh, manna from heaven, the water from the rock, and so forth that 
during the time of the church's initial being built, from Pentecost to A.D. 70, these signs and wonders were needed in order to establish the church, that these were gifts that God had given for that particular time. And as, as uh, Brother Steve mentioned, the secession of them comes when the perfect comes. So as preterists, we see that the return of Christ in A.D. 70, the demolishing of the old covenant and the completely establishing of the new, that that is the perfect. No other uh, covenant will be coming after this, no other kingdom, no other anything else. So we have everything all in all. Uh, so that there would be a secession. There doesn't seem to be that need for it at this particular, from AD 70 on. Well, I, I just wanted to respond to that quickly. Um, I, uh, I appreciate what both of you said. I totally agree. So um, one of the things um, for me with tongues is that when I read the Bible and I read the New Testament, I realize that most of the things that are found in the New Testament were working toward the grander goal. The grand goal was for all things to be summed up in Jesus Christ. That was the goal from AD 30 to AD 70, right? That would be our, our goal is to see these things summed up in Jesus, to find completion, to find the Jew and Gentile, these two separate bodies to be brought together and formed into one new man, as we read about in Ephesians. So, again, the tongues, which had everything to do with going out to the nations and preaching the gospel and, you know, men of different nations being able to understand one another, that, that applied in that context, that they needed tongues to, you know, speak to each other and to bring the Gentiles into, to bring the nations into the riches of, G of what the new covenant life was going to be. Um, today, I, I liked how Steve had put it... Um, in regards to people's personal experience and prayer, I, I am, you know, and I believe we need to be cautious there because I never want to disqualify someone's personal experiences with God, and um, you know, I'm just not that person. Um, I, I believe that we should be encouraging people in their walk with Christ, and you know, um, that there's things that I know I do. I raise my hands in worship. I get on my knees when I pray. I know there's plenty of people that think that might be silly and you know, pointless. Um, however, I, I view that just as valid as you know the. My brother, and you know, you've seen I've had many charismatic people here this weekend, and you know, I, I worship with them. I, you know, I, I might get a bit distracted from their their tongues in, in the background. However, I, I believe that that's just as valid of worshiping God as when I get on my knees and I, I pray to my God, and I believe that's equipping me to be strong for for Him. So I, I wouldn't want to disqualify someone's experiences with um, their understanding of tongues. All right. Well, uh, with that set up, you had a question. Well, yeah, that's cool. good. It's actually in regard to Steve's answer to that. Okay. Um, if everything has ceased, mm -hmm. does God, is God sent prophets at all anymore at the periodic when it's on, according to his agenda? Because when you said all things ceased, that was in 1 Corinthians 13, and that was about the gift of prophecy when he was in particular when in the context. And so does that mean there is no such thing as any prophecy at all? For the last 2,000 years? No matter prophecy? Now, when you mention prophecy in this context, are you talking about some sort of foretelling of what's to come in the future? Well, I'm, I'm mentioning that that's the, the context of the pattern of what you quoted. That it was about when the perfect has come, these things shall cease, and you're talking about prophecy on that particular context. And so, are you saying that all prophecy ceased when the perfect came? There's never been another prophecy for the last 2,000 years? <coughs> prophecy as to... Uh, the, the, I, I'm, I, I'm I, sorry. It, I, it is the yeah. only, that's the only thing Paul was talking about at that section. He starts in 1 Corinthians 12 about the gifts and how the, the, there weren't signs at that point. They were for the administration of the needs of the body. And then he goes on about love in the first part of 13. Then he goes on, if you want to have a spiritual gift, seek prophecy. And then he goes on about prophecy, and that's when he uses what you quoted, that when that which is perfect has come, this will, this will cease. And that was about prophecy, that was about pro the gifts in general, but prophecy in particular. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 14 to talk about the rules and regulations for the use of tongues and the rules and regulations for the use of prophecy. And those three verses, are the, those three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, are the only place in the whole Bible that talks about spiritual gifts. Nowhere else. And it was because the Corinthians were a baby church that were wild drink, getting drunk in, in, in communion and all that. I understand all that. But yours was, your premise was that it stopped 
right. when the perfect came. And so, since the topic that Paul was talking about was prophecy, you're saying that all prophecy stop? Well, I would, I, in, in the way that I would phrase it is that all prophecy having to do with the future, anything that in regards to, you know, we have the prophets of the old that spoke of uh, Babylon coming in and, and, and conquering them or, or what have you. Uh, in my opinion, yes, I think that those had stopped. In prophesying and speaking of the gospel and sharing that, certainly not. That's what built the, uh, the church. Um, that if, that, if that's a prophetic way of speaking... Well, I, I wasn't talking about a uh, prophetic style of witnessing. I was talking about prophecy, which is the foretelling. God saying, this is what my message is to my people which is what the prophets were throughout all of history. Right, and, and he spoke, and they spoke to his people as a nation. Uh, and I do not see in the scriptures any other prophecy that has not been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I know, that wasn't that. I was, you're, you're saying that all oh, prophecy ceased at that moment, which is the present tense. In other words, that God would never send another prophet, never talk to his people directly through prophecy or anything else. Amen. That's what. That's what. If you're claiming that 70 A.D. was the perfect coming, then the only interpretation of that has to be that God will never speak to His people again. Well, well, no. I. I he speaks to us every day. We pick up His word. No, no, no. That's that. that's yeah. That's the Spirit bearing witness and all that. Um, I'm talking about using prophecy to speak to His people, where God says, you know. You have some Aaron group, and God in his mercy sends somebody to say, repent. God sent me to tell you to repent. I tell that person to And that doesn't exist if it's all at the it. And so I'm asking, is this what you're this is well, that's a good question. Because we have times I'm like trying not to make an argument because I'm really great not awakening. Awakening. I really want to know what your stance is on that. Because <laughs> there are times in the Great Awakening and things like that where there was a revival. So yeah, that they, so God hard. did use an individual in order to ignite, like with Charles Spurgeon. No, we read no. There are examples. No, Remember 1 Corinthians 10 11, he's using examples from the Bible to still prophesy to people that need to repent. There's nothing new. We're done. Everything's been fulfilled, right? There's no new prophets. All right. Thank by you. By the way, I, 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 I don't no, no. agree with you. Excuse I me. Just, it was just your All right. Way. It's going where I don't want it to go. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. People. I'm sorry. Please. I didn't mean to take it. No, no. Hey, you're asking a question. I, I want to get your question answered. Valid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, and I by general, by the way, Steve, by general principle, I agree with you. Yeah. It was just an example that I disagree. Yeah. Okay. With. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree. I agree with Pastor Stephen. I what I what I what I see biblically when you when you use the word prophet or uh, some would use the word prophet, prophet, some people yeah. prophet spring prophecy. A deliver prophecy. Where you, when you speak of messengers and prophets, you're speaking about revelation from God. Mm -hmm. And yes, I am. And then what happens is, I believe, you know, that that the scriptures tell me when I read that since all has been fulfilled and the perfect has come, the age of prophecy has closed of biblical covenant prophecy because there are no new revelations. The definition of the perfect coming means there is perfect revelation. Doesn't mean we have to that we know it all when we read the Bible once. We have to continue to study. But the um, prophets foretelling the coming of the Messiah closed. Uh, prophets foretelling what the kingdom will look like closed. Prophets foretelling um, a judgment against those who are idolaters or those outside of Christ because they're rejecting Christ and for this reason will not receive entrance into the kingdom. Closed. Um, so, uh, so uh, but yes, God does reveal himself to us every day. God reveals himself in different ways. That, that I don't consider prophecy. I consider that, the, you know, coming from the helper, the Holy Spirit, he who guides us. Any more questions? Yeah. Question? I, I actually, I just want to respond to that question before uh, we bring more questions in. Um, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 begins at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And the goal of this writing is written to the church at Corinth to instruct them they were dividing because, remember, there were some that were saying they were under Apollos, there were some that were saying they were under 
Paul. They had this Jew, you know, Gentile uh, supremacy. They had this Jewish supremacy happening. The man in, speaking of his father's wife. <laughs> right. Well, yes, you had all of that. And a lot of that comes from the confusion of Gentile supremacy and Jewish supremacy. You had different groups of people coming together and bringing all sorts of confusion into the body of Christ. By the time, you know, one thing I'll say is Alan Bondar actually has an entire series on the book of Corinthians called Transition. He goes through each chapter, shows you the different transitions from the old to the new, and how all of this is uh, being made, made very clear, and how ultimately you come to understand the resurrection of the dead that's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, by understanding the context of the writing to the Corinthians. In chapter four, uh, 13 and 14, uh, I mean, even going back to chapters 11, what we're still dealing with is the bringing in of Jew and Gentile. That's the goal of the, of the prophecy. The, a prophecy that you're finding in your New Testament is bringing together the Jew and the Gentile into one glorious body. So okay. that's, right, so well, I'm going to make a point here. Now all of that prophecy, again, Hebrews chapter 1 says that in times past, God spoke to his people through prophets in diverse, diverse manners in different places. Now he speaks to his people through the Son. That's how he speaks to his people. Oh. Well, he spoke, right. He spoke, okay, and he spoke. He spoke, that's it. He spoke to his people through his son. There's no need for prophets to come to God's people. He has laid the foundation, united the two bodies. That's what all of this is detailing. The bringing together of those two bodies. That's the context of the prophecies. So the prophecy, yes, in this context, is bringing together of the Jew and Gentile, and all of that has been made complete. It's perfect. We don't need prophets to come and give us prophecy in bringing together Jew and Gentile any longer. So all of this has been made complete. Now, what we're talking about today, um, I do believe in a, you know, a modern application of the fivefold ministry. Um, I do believe, you know, we have people in our church that I would say that are pastoral, prophetic in, in certain areas of calling. Do I believe that they have a gift of um, speaking an exhortive word to the body of Christ? Absolutely. But we would not, that's, again, we'd have to go through the entire context of the book of Corinthians, verse upon verse, line upon line, and we would see that that's all about bringing together Jew and Gentile into one glorious body. That's the entire context of the Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians. So I don't believe we could just start at chapters 13 and 14 and find our answer. We would have to understand the entire point of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Yes. And I believe that that shows us that the prophecy he's talking about there is the prophecy of bringing together Jew and Gentile. So Jews and Gentiles are completely brought together at 70 AD because that's perfect. And see, this by applying this verse to that subject matter, to me, doesn't matter. Well, it's the entire letter to the Corinthians. It's, yeah. That, that would be the context, so that's what we yes. have to apply. And, the, and there are subcontexts, and the subcontext, which begins in chapter 12 and ends in 14, is about the use of spiritual gifts within, within the body of Christ. It starts there and ends there, and it's all on that. And with a little section smack in the middle about how love be the best of all. Uh, if you do not have love, if you do not have charity, yeah. or charity, love, whatever, how. Um, but just below that, this is talking about if you want a gift, push the gift of prophecy. If you want a gift from God. Right. And it's understandable because that's God directly talking and you listening. That is the best gift you can get. Yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on because I do believe that we end up when we do that subcontext thing, I, I think we end up in trouble because the chapters 12 and no, 14 aren't their own section. That's hermeneutics. You guys All right, I don't want to. Hermeneutics, hermeneutics yeah. is, is analyzing to the nth degree and then going back and saying, what does it say to the big picture? And I understand the part of hermeneutics making it relevant, the audience relevance you're saying was the merger of the the Jew and the Greek. Mm -hmm. Or the Jew and the Gentile, actually, you said it correctly. Yeah. The Jew and the Greek is not correct. Uh, although Corinth being a major Greek city. Um, but generally, most of the time, the New Testament uses the word Greek, they meant Hellenist Jew. Um, and not a Gentile. Usually they mean Gentile, they say Gentile. But anyway, I agree with some of the subcontext. I, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I distracted the whole thing. Let me retreat. I will shut my mouth and I will smile. You don't have to shut your mouth and smile. No worries. You did ask a question. We gave you an answer. Well, I, I don't mean to uh, mean to beat the dead horse. I don't think he's quite dead. Um, on the issue of tongues and back in the, the timeline up a little bit to the you know what I told you, you know words speaking about it here. We're going back to Prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days. God says, I will pour out my Pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And young men shall see visions, old men dream dreams. I think we're all familiar with this 
continuing on down to uh, the last bit, and they shall prophesy. Mm -hmm. So I look at, again, I'm talking about Acts 2, uh, day of Pentecost, where, again, I'm, I'm just seeing Acts 2, 4, they're, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, again, speak in other tongues. So again, I just, I don't quite see the mystery in understanding what tongues were, and why they would have a, a time span, when the can was, was in fact closed, why am I going to need new inspiration? Because I can, I can prophesy, as, as we said, by just opening this up and reading it. I'm continuing a lifetime of study, and I'm continuing to find new prophecy yeah. as I find something I didn't see before, but I'm not bringing forth anything straight from the Word of God in an unknown language. And again, they didn't know how to speak Arabian. Spoke it, didn't even know they were. Which is the religion for new folks. Is that a question for us? So I'm, I'm just. I'm, I'm prophesying. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to end us in prayer. Can I just comment on him a little bit? Please, well. That was the sign, which is totally different. Signs are completely different than, than the gifts of God. I don't know about tongues. It's a Tom, All right, I'm going to end us in prayer. I'm tired. Sorry, I'm tired. I'm going to end us in prayer. Um, we can talk after. Yeah, we got to, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, since we're in that area, it says uh, everything needs to be done with decency and in order. And what we, uh, one thing we're going to do in our community next year, I'm excited for our conference next year, is because we're going to be on time. We're going to listen to the instructions of the things that we're doing. And um, it's going to be an exciting year. So please join me in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I magnify you, Lord. I thank you for being in this place, Lord. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray that we will always, we can be ourselves, Lord. We can understand each other. We can grow together in these things. That we can have conversations with each other and be civil. That we can glorify you in our conversations and our deeds. That we can truly allow this truth that we've been learning this entire weekend to build up in our life. That we would see you more clearly in our lives through the, our witnessing to others, through the way we speak to one another through the way that we pray to you and seek you, Lord. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for your calming and your peaceful presence that we would continue to seek you evermore. Lord, I, I thank you for the men that have sat up on this panel. I thank you for the questions that were submitted. We magnify you, Lord. We thank you for the little bit of wisdom that you do give each and every one of us. We thank you for the portion that you have given each and every one of us. And we pray that we will walk worthy of all that we do know. That we would continue to strive to study your scriptures and bring glory to you. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for the new covenant. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. We magnify you this day. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.